With that being said, our next presenter, Hala Ali, unfortunately could not be with us today due to unforeseen circumstances. So I will now attempt a somewhat improvised possession enactment of Hala's presentation based on her notes. This is not bespoke, so we will see how it fits off the rack. In the classic crime fiction trial comedy, My Cousin Vinny, Joe Pesci appears as defense counsel, entering a courtroom wearing an all black outfit, replete with a statement black leather jacket. The judge admonishes him for the state of his appearance, asking, what are you wearing? Pesci answers, I'm wearing clothes. The judge continues, when you come into my court, looking as you do, you not only insult me, but you insult the integrity of this court. Next time you come into my courtroom, you will look lawyerly. And I mean, you comb your hair and wear a suit and tie. And that suit better be made of some kind of cloth. A formulation ensues on criteria, diction, intelligibility, attitude, and matter of lawyerliness, and also wardrobe as attendant to attitude, wardrobe that undoes the sanitation protocols of the courtroom. Sartorial expression is undoubtedly a political act. We see this no more clearly than with dictators. Stalin, Mao, Hitler, Mussolini, all maintained their political allegiances by retaining sartorial traces of the working class. Mujik peasant dress, uh, blue worker's jacket, brown shirt, and black shirt, for which Mussolini is often credited as among the first to turn a sartorial choice into a political symbol. Fashion, while a universal language, is also deeply vernacular. Native and Latin Americans refused to adopt European dress as a form of resistance, while some anti-colonial Indonesians and post-1868 Japanese did. The toga was regarded as a sign of masculinity for the Greeks and Romans, but when worn by Gaddafi and Omar al-Mukhtar, were cast as effeminate and primitive. When we think of the uniform specifically, many post-colonial states were born out of revolutions or coups with which the military uniform emerges extravagantly, embraced and worn as a great equalizer in service to the nation, pictured against the idea of elite garment. And of course, the link between militarization and masculinity is universal. I'd like to play a short excerpt now from the 1981 film, Line of the Desert, depicting the life of Omar al-Mukhtar, played by Anthony Quinn, and uh, Mukhtar's struggle against the Italians. So the clip you're about to see takes place toward the end of the film and depicts Mukhtar's uh, capture by the Italian forces. Uh, also to note, Lion of the Desert was funded by Gaddafi and was in fact banned in Italy for damage against the honor of the Italian military. The ban was later removed in 2009, coinciding with an appearance, Gaddafi's first official visit to Italy. And the film was screened on Sky Italia during his visit. I'd like you to pay close attention to the musical score, the framing, the blocking, and the outfitting of the figures on screen, particularly prosthetics and props, and how they draw multiple registers of dynamics of power.
boy. Don't beg. Avanti! You are taken in arms. You, shoot him. There are more in there. Follow them up. Go on. You took him. Shoot him. <laughs> you idiot. I said I shoot him. Where is he? Uh, Sam, it says that you've blocked my video. Thanks. Okay. So, by the end of the 19th century, the three provinces that comprise modern Libya Cyrenaica, Tropiltania, and Fazan were the only territories in Northern Africa, in North Africa, unclaimed by a European power. Italy, Germany, France, and the UK began showing interest, with the Italians finally laying claim. The Italian colonial period from 1911 to 1943 was incontestably brutal, moving large percentages of the population to concentration camps and causing the death of about 250 to 300,000 people. The total population of the region at the time was 800,000 to a million people. So we're talking about almost a third of the region's entire population. Between 1930 to 31 alone, an estimated 12,000 Libyans were executed by the Italian fascists, most notably among them Omar al-Mukhtar. Al-Mukhtar, the chosen one, was leader of the Bedouin guerrillas resisting the Italian occupation and famously evaded capture for about eight years. And during this time, the Italian forces referred to him as the devil. I have a note here from Hala that says, quote, mention that in this naming, the Italians effectively dress Mukhtar as a devil. I would go a step further, she says, and make the comparison to the Grim Reaper, loose robes, hood, certainly an individual that brings harm and death, shadowy, evading capture, operating at night, and so forth, which resembles al-Mukhtar's career of undetected resistance, hidden in the mountains, which also sets up an appearance precedent that, of course, finds eager custodians later on. We don't see it in Anthony Quinn's uh, depiction, but al-Mukhtar was also known for his trademark prescription glasses. In fact, when they found his glasses on the battlefield, Italian army commander Marshal Rodolfo Graziani made the famous statement, quote, today we took Al Mukhtar's glasses, tomorrow we will take his head. Sam, next slide, please.
Thank you. This image taken by the Italians after al Muqtar's capture served not only as documentation of the event, but also took on the status of souvenir or trophy, much like the image trope of hunters in formation showcasing their catch. It's also the same scene we see dramatized, reenacted, restaged in the clip we saw earlier from Lion in the Desert. Notice the uniforms, the cinched waists, the demeanor, the smug expressions on the senior officers' faces, the pot bellies ready to erupt, the tumbling robes, the chains, one on each wrist, each arm secured by a different officer, producing, anticipating, and also corroborating this idea of imminent threat, threat to be contained, surrounded, commanded. What followed this image was a trial. Let's call it trial one. Now, generally for a legal system to have any kind of legitimacy, it has to be seen as legitimate by the people who are governed by it. That justice, as the legal aphorism goes, is not only to be done, but to be seen to be done. What is called open justice calls the form of the open trial in which the average everyday citizen has right and access and viewer seat to the justice mechanics of the state. Counter to this would be the secret trial as anathema to justice. Only one side found al Muqtar's trial to be legitimate, the Italians. Libyans saw this overwhelmingly as a sham trial and did not acknowledge its authority, not only because colonization was not seen as legitimate, but specifically because of al-Muqtar's ill treatment by his captors, ill treatment that produces this image and ill treatment that this image produces. During the trial, the Italians offered to let al-Muqtar leave Libya if he called on his mujahideen to abandon their armed struggle. Not one to waste an opportunity to grandstand, he effectively forfeited his opportunity to flee in order to utter his most famous words. Quote, my forefinger, which attests at each prayer that there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, cannot write a single word of falsehood. We will not surrender. We will be victorious or we will die. This is also one key trope in courtroom procedural cinema. Anytime there is a kangaroo court, a dictator stands up and declares his disavowal, of the legitimacy of, uh, of their own trial. Another key trope is the idea of equality of arms. The Italians had a genuine belief that they were unlike other colonizers, that they were a poor proletarian nation simply seeking an outlet for its surplus population. At the same time, General Graziani of the Italian forces famously stated in speeches to his troops, quote, you are Romans fighting against barbarians. Be kind to them, but always be their superiors. Al-Muqtar was a notable exception to this, viewed overwhelmingly as worthy opponent by Italian generals in the war combative register. Al-Muqtar trounced them time and time again in that arena, but once they got him into the trial procedural arena, they got him. Their entering of Mukhtar into the legal register was to deploy that framework as rubber stamp to ensure his removal from the war combative register. Here, legal is one such framework within an arsenal, deployed or vacated for convenience or for effectiveness of yield. The formulation here is that multiple framework registers are produced simultaneously. If you can't overcome your adversary under the protocols of one framework, the counter tactic is to fashion, then apply another framework, one that your adversary cannot adequately meet you in. As they say in America, you can indict a ham sandwich, but you can't indict a pig. al Muqtar was eventually executed in the presence of 20,000 Libyans who were forcibly assembled. After Italy's major defeat in World War II, it lost control of Libya, which was then unified and established as a kingdom by the UK and France, the so-called great powers. 
A reluctant Western friendly leader was installed ushering in mass corruption and a general suspicion of the notion of modern statehood, laying fertile ground for revolution. Then in 1969, a bloodless coup takes place led by young officers and captains with two major themes that resonate at the time, resentment of Western intervention and a call to Arab nationalism inspired by Jamal Abdel Nasser next door. Enter Muammar Gaddafi, seen here moments after descending the stairs of his plane, wheels still hot on Roman tarmac, marking the first time any Libyan leader has set foot on Italian soil. Flanking Gaddafi, his squad of virgin bodyguards who never left his side. Walking alongside him, Berlusconi. Actually, Sam, would you mind going to the other slide, the um, zoom out slide? Yeah, thank you. So walking alongside him, Berlusconi, uh, moments after descending the stairs of the plane. Worn on his uniform, a photo of the capture of Omar al-Mukhtar. The occasion, a victory lap, a photo op, a scene a being seen to have done on the heels of an arrangement between the two countries that Italy would acknowledge its colonial history and pay reparations. In many ways, a culminating performance in Gaddafi's political career, a career defined by an incessant quest to put colonialism on trial, a career defined by the unabashed issuing of claims, a career of overt theatricality and aestheticization, in speech, in act, and in dress, wearing his politics not only on his sleeve, but as his sleeve. Let us not forget, this is Gaddafi who, when he comes to power, implements national policies on literacy, healthcare, education, subsidies for housing, and also notably kicks out all Italians. Gaddafi, who also hired 200 Italian models to attend his lecture as a bid to convert them to Islam. Gaddafi, who renamed Libya the Socialist People's Libyan Arab Jamahiriya, a Gaddafi neologism meaning that the people govern themselves without the apparatus of the modern state. Gaddafi, who gave a one hour and 40 minute filibuster speech at the UN that went on six times longer than his allotted time during which he demanded the UN move its headquarters to Libya so that he could avoid jet lag. He was in fact afraid of flying. Gaddafi, who wondered aloud whether swine flu was a biological weapon created in a military lab. Gaddafi, who had an undying crush on Condoleezza Rice. Gaddafi, who kept a homemade scrapbook in his palace filled with cut out photos of her. Gaddafi, who demanded to know who was behind the killing of JFK. Gaddafi, who tore up a copy of the UN Charter in front of startled delegates whilst likening the Security Council to an Al-Qaeda-like terrorist body. Gaddafi, who called for George Bush and Tony Blair to be put on trial for the Iraq War. Gaddafi, who demanded $7.7 .7 trillion in compensation for the ravages of colonialism on Africa. Gaddafi, who also declared himself the president of the African Union and the king of kings of Africa. Gaddafi, who gave his first speech as leader in front of Omar al-Mukhtar's tomb on the 38th anniversary of his execution. Here, another personal note from Hala, quote, also Gaddafi was killed on my birthday, forever cementing our relationship. This image, Berlusconi and Gaddafi walking side by side, Gaddafi wearing al-Mukhtar represents the culmination of seeking remedy, the verdict, if you will. Where trial one happens in Libya, trial two happens when Gaddafi steps off the plane in Rome. Geography has changed, uh, the entire apparatus is different, jurisdiction is different, and the Italians now have cost to benefit. With this agreement comes the promise of cheap oil. And yet, this is still a huge feat for Gaddafi, especially given his tendency for aggressive, hostile foreign policy. What we see in this image is the silhouette of someone who has realized that he has to jump through procedural hoops in order to use 
the legal apparatus to get what he wants, to have his case be heard, to shape how he appears in the ear of the stenographer. Can we go to the previous slide, please, Sam? Okay, so by the time we zoom back in, the image has moved. We see it entered into a framework of Gaddafi's making, one that he commands, framing the event with red braided strand, worn on his chest as a mark of honor and merit, worn on military uniform, black shirt, recalling the very same Italian fascists who drew the picture he now dons. Gaddafi was a gifted propagandist, visually astute, even if sometimes in the most gaudy of ways. He understood that his was a world dominated by images and their circulations. He understood that he needed to be speaking, even when he was not speaking. He thought not only of posture and manner, but of visual representation. He practiced this prolifically and obsessively, something he learned from the Italians. Where Al Mukhtar was pictured as captive framed by Italian forces, now Gaddafi pictures those same Italian officers framed by Libyan military paraphernalia of ribbons and decorations. Italy's trophy subverted and recontextualized as Gaddafi's victory against Italy's colonial past. Al Mukhtar is nonetheless framed, but uh, Gaddafi's move here is to appear as the post colonial subject who now gets to do the framing, to forever frame its meaning, the frame serving as the last word, the final judgment, no right to appeal. In this second trial, Gaddafi assumes the role of judge, jury, and executioner, and this image is his Exhibit A, entered into proceedings with utter disregard for admissibility. Rules of admissibility are a key part of rules of evidence. Usually before a trial, whatever evidence might be admitted is presented to the judge alone, who acts as a regulating body. Criteria for admittance is highly contested, considered in part for relevance and whether the evidence's probative value outweighs its prejudicial value. What we are looking at here is textbook prejudicial. The image is still documentary, but no longer evidence of it, Italy's capture of Al Mukhtar. Now it comes as evidence of Italy's brutality and as memorial. Gaddafi elected none of the many iconic symbolic images of Al Mukhtar victorious, but instead chose an image of Al Mukhtar's treatment at the hands of the Italians, a kind of Libyan hashtag never forget. It's important to note also that Gaddafi plays this appearance also to enter as adversary, to set the conditions of equality of arms, an idea played out to a great extent in contract law, but generally negotiation between two parties from equitable positions of bargain and leverage. Uh, if you're a big corporation and I'm a tiny individual, or if you're the state and I'm the citizen, there's no equality of arms. In order for adversarial legitimacy, there has to be equality of arms. Otherwise, it's a beating. That's why they're lawyers, uh, equality of representation. What's interesting here is that Gaddafi was not satisfied with this, at least by the time he walked out of his plane. The picture of Al Mukhtar he wears looks to be affixed with sellotape, crudely, as if in haste. What's clear is that Gaddafi's grievance continues post-settlement. It's not sufficient for an agreement to be signed by two countries on a piece of paper, but that insufficiency is ostensibly accounted for the moment, is ostensibly accounted for the moment he steps off the plane. In that moment, settlement has been agreed, but grievance is still worn and still seen to be worn. In law, to compensate for loss is to put the claimant in whatever position had harm not been done. But a win or a loss does not encapsulate the manifold expectations and functions that a lawsuit performs. Rather, by its mere existence, the lawsuit performs many non pecuniary functions. Lawsuits serve a truth function, set precedent, 
advance the law itself, but lawsuits also enter the larger public imagination, sparking discourse networks and forms of mediation. Before wearing this picture, Gaddafi already had an agreement of acknowledgement and compensation. What Gaddafi does is to open the floor to victim impact statement after the sentency to grievance unmet by compensation to life lived with debts unpaid. <laughs> 